listen for God's word as it speaks to us. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. May God bless to us this reading, for this is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the the gospel account of the temptation of Jesus, well, it, it almost lets us off the hook. Why? Well, <clears throat> as you read it, as you study it, you find it is so crammed with symbolism. Symbolism. Forty days and nights, which calls to mind Noah's 40 days and nights afloat in the ark, Israel's 40 years in the wilderness, Elijah's 40 days in the desert, etc. Three temptations. Well, three is a very powerful biblical symbol. After all, we have the three repetitions of the covenant making. We have <clears throat> the three parts of the persons of the Trinity. We have three repetitions of the time Jesus questions John's love for him, the third day of the resurrection, three. And the wilderness, the wilderness also is a powerful symbol of preparation and of prophetic initiation, a symbol of struggle, even of purification. So in this short passage, we have all the symbolism that's crammed into this account, into this retelling. And so it it seems to propel and elevate this passage into the realm of theological interpretation and sermonic pondering. But what does it have to do with regular people and their everyday lives? Everything. Because Matthew was not writing his gospel for theologians or for seminary students or professors. The symbolism in this passage is not meant to obscure. And the message is not some vague moralism about avoiding temptations. The point of this temptation account is very much in tune with another story we're familiar with, the creation account, where it's filled with all kinds of symbolism. Yes, theological, but also very relevant to everyday life and who we are. The point is this, a question really, who is in the driver's seat in your life? The driver's seat, just just imagine how cute it was many years ago when little Tommy's parents saw four-year-old me sitting behind the huge steering wheel in our Pontiac Chieftain going four years old, vroom, vroom, vroom. Yeah, all together now. 
Yes, it was Charlotte, North Carolina, which is the heart and center of NASCAR fame, the World 600, Fireball Roberts, Kel Yarborough, Richard Petty. Besides, I didn't have the keys. <laughs> Let's fast forward to teenage Tom pulling out of the driveway alone, hands on the steering wheel, fresh license in his pocket, big smile, freedom, autonomy, power, decisions to make, and places to go. As I recall, the look on my parents' faces at that time was not exactly how cute. <laughs> but to put it in perspective, this was my dad's six-cylinder push-button automatic Dodge Dart. <laughs> you remember that awful car? And this was in the era of muscle cars, which all my friends seemed to have. I'm driving a Dodge Dart. <laughs> but the big question was not what kind of car, but what kind of driver. And who was really in the driver's seat? Wisdom or impulsiveness? The Bible, I think, draws a somewhat similar parallel when you think about it with Adam and Jesus. After all, the Apostle Paul in his writings refers to Jesus as the second Adam. And you see, in both of the stories of the creation story with Adam and temptation story with Jesus, it is the nature of humankind to want to be physically and psychologically and emotionally and spiritually in the driver's seat, even when it comes to relating to God and to God's creation. Now that is temptation. When I was at seminary and later doing my doctoral work at Princeton Seminary, one of my mentors and friends was Dr. Diogenes Allen. And Dr. Allen once wrote a book that was uh, a book that he described as for those just becoming Christian. And so it was taking on head on some of these concepts that seemed kind of strange. And he speaks a lot about the temptations there. And he, he says the temptations are not necessarily things that are bad. It's just what they are to us and how we use them and what they say about our relationship with God. For instance, the spiritual knowledge of good and evil seems to Adam like a pretty good thing. You know, a pretty handy thing to have. Might save a lot of trouble. Might answer a few troubling questions. Might even give him a sense of how to get out of this monotonous garden. Certainly there's things beyond. So all this is running through his mind when he has that piece of fruit. Never says apple, by the way. Piece of fruit is tempted. And so he takes a bite, he ingests the fruit, such that it becomes part of who he is. And Adam thought that this was going to be a special treat, so he could be in the driver's seat. He could distinguish between ultimate good and evil. And in doing so, as the story goes, Adam seeks to deny the human limits of what he is able to know, able to understand. He seeks to become, it says, like God. And suddenly, one who was unashamed of the naked limitation of humanity now becomes ashamed of who he is and what he was created to be. That story in Genesis is a symbol of our will to try to be God unto ourselves when we know in our hearts that we cannot be God unto ourselves. So the temptation is to deny who we really are and what we are. And for Jesus, Jesus in the wilderness is very, very hungry, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. I love the understatement of the next sentence, and he was famished. Well, duh. <laughs> yes, he was famished. And so at that point, however you look at that story as symbolic or actual, Jesus, at this point, can start making excuses to take shortcuts on being human, like turning rocks into bread. After all, he is the Son of God, 
So he should be allowed to take a shortcut so he can keep his strength up, 40 days and nights of fasting. Come on, Jesus. Play God just this once. It's for a good cause. Temptation. Methodist Bishop William Willimon remembers a time when he led an adult Sunday school class that was studying this very passage of Jesus in the wilderness and the temptations. And after careful study and explanation of the three temptations, uh, Dr. Willman said, how are we tempted today? And there was one young salesman who was first to speak, and he said, temptation is when your boss calls you in, as mine did yesterday, and says, I'm going to give you a real opportunity. I'm going to give you a bigger sales territory. We believe that you're going places, young man. And he told his boss, but I, I don't want a bigger sales territory. I'm already away from home four nights a week. It wouldn't be fair to my wife and daughter. Look, the boss replied, we're, we're asking you to do this for your wife and daughter. Don't you want to be a good father? It takes money to support a family these days. Surely your little girl doesn't take much money now, but think of the future. Think of her future. I'm only asking you to do this for them. The young man concluded sadly, now that's temptation. And we don't know what he decided. When we convince ourselves that we are wiser than we really are, or when we motivate ourselves to take shortcuts that we delude ourselves or our right to take. We play God in our own lives. Well then, Jesus, what about showing off for the good folks of Jerusalem? Come on, jump off the temple top, swoop down there and claim the prize you deserve, the adoration that's due to the Messiah, the authority of the cheering masses. Just once, just once. Think about all that wasted time of suffering that you'll pass up. You won't have to wait for the resurrection to be worshipped. You can set up the Davidic kingdom right here and now. Come on, surely God will let you take charge now when the time is ripe and expectations are high. But we know human nature, how quickly the crowds and cheers of Jerusalem would have turned on Jesus after his stunt was over. The people who only cheer the miraculous wonder workers often very quickly turn on those who then call them to sacrifice of themselves. He would have gained short-term adoration, and it would have been Jesus' undoing as well. Finally, finally, the tempter tries one more last grand attempt to get Jesus to do something that seems pretty reasonable. Though to be the king of kings, with no real effort on your part, all the kingdoms of this world, if Jesus will decide for himself who he will worship. You decide, Jesus. All the risk will be eliminated. All the danger will be subdued. All the suffering and disappointment, the hard work, the rejection, eliminated. All that would make him a human being, following the oft times puzzling leading of God also, out of the way. It must surely have looked like the way to go at the moment, or else it would not have been a temptation, would it? For the alternative was to stand firm for truth, when truth looked like a road to destruction. There was once an account that came out of Soviet-era Russia at the time when religion was officially repressed and people were persecuted for faith. And one Sunday at a house church, believers inconspicuously arrived in small groups throughout the day so they wouldn't rouse the suspicion of the KGB. At dusk, they were all safely inside and they closed the doors and windows and they began quietly singing a hymn with deep emotion. And suddenly the door was pushed open and two soldiers barged in with automatic weapons. And one of them shouted, All right, everyone line up against the wall. 
If you renounce your commitment to Jesus Christ, leave now. And two or three quickly left. And then another. After a few seconds, a few more. This is your last chance. Either turn against your faith in Christ or else stay and suffer the consequences. Another left. And finally, two in embarrassed silence with their faces covered slipped out into the night. But no one else moved. And parents with small trembling children beside them looked down reassuringly. And they fully expected to be, at best, imprisoned. And after a few moments of total silence, the other soldier closed the door, looked back at those against the wall, and said, Keep your hands up. But this time in praise to our Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, for we too are Christians. We were sent to another house several weeks ago to arrest a group of believers. And then the other soldier interrupted, Yes, but instead we were converted. But we've learned by experience, however, that unless people are willing to die for their faith, they cannot be trusted. With our Lenten focus on Micah 6, 8, this first Sunday, we seek to understand what it means to an individual to do justice. And in our common understanding of the English word justice, it, it means things like it should, fairness and legal protections, and maybe law and order for the common good. But the biblical term that we translate as justice is sadek, which means also righteousness. It means be right with God, making the choices that are, are right and just and true to God. And so ultimately doing justice involves listening for God to guide our hearts, to reveal to us what is truth, and to have the faith and the courage to then choose God's ways, regardless of the challenge, regardless of the cost. Or to be put another way, who is in the driver's seat of my life? Because I know that my temptation, the temptation, is to say me. But if the Son of God the Son of God can decide to let God remain in the driver's seat in his life, even when it means taking that long, difficult road, being the human being he was born to be, and showing us a way to live a spiritual life instead of a cautious life, then perhaps we might also have the strength and the courage to let God drive for us as well. And so during this Lenten journey, friends, let's, let's find ways and let's share ways to acknowledge and to accept our humanness, our frailty, our need for God to guide our lives and our church. Let each one of us choose for ourselves to do justice as God leads us. And in so doing, let's find our calling to reach out in good and truth, to reach out in mercy and compassion, in love, in mutual care to others and with others so that, so that our mutual creatureliness, in it we will find that we never have to stand above others, but to stand with others, to journey with others. Because it's then that we find God is journeying with us. God's justice journeying with us on life's way. Amen.